Ani Buju Kwe Skanakawaga Tonshi. Hello and welcome, everyone. We would like to start our session today by taking time to acknowledge and to honor the land that we live on and our relationship to Indigenous peoples. We do this because we desire to share a place that is just and equitable and because we recognize and respect Indigenous peoples prior and continued claims to the land and to our shared responsibility for caring for the land, water, and our relationships. This land is the traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and most recently the Massas Mississaugas of Pret River First Nations. Ontario is covered by 46 treaties and other agreements and is home to many Indigenous nations from across Turtle Island, including the Inuit and the Métis. These agreements and other treaties, including the One Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, are agreements to peaceably share and care for the land and its resources. Other Indigenous nations, Europeans and newcomers were invited into this covenant in the spirit of respect, peace and friendship. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as immigrants, newcomers in this generation or generations past. And we have benefited and built wealth from the land that indigenous people shared. We are mindful of broken covenants and their impact on the health and well-being of indigenous peoples. And we strive to make this right with the land and with each other. As the president of the Georgia Bay Association, I welcome each of you here today for the last of our three extreme webinar, uh, Water Levels, Impacts and Strategies webinars. <clears throat> Excuse me. These webinars are jointly sponsored by the Georgia Bay Association, Georgia Bay Forever, and are in collaboration with our partners, the International Joint Commissions, Severn Sound Environmental Association and Council of the Great Lakes Region. All three webinars, <clears throat> are meant to give you a better idea as to how we can best adapt to current water levels, future water level forecasts, and the potential climate change impacts on Georgian Bay and your cottage properties. As you've seen, there are a few housekeeping uh, items that have flashed across the screen, but just to review them, uh, a recording of the presentation and a written synopsis report will be available after the session. Please type your questions into the Q&A box so that we can record them. If we are not able to answer all the questions in the session, we will answer the questions in a follow-up report. Uh, we also want, would like to remind you that uh, we will not be addressing high water uh, level questions today because they were dealt in last year's dealt with in last year's water symposium, and you can find those answers from the experts on our respective websites at GBA and GBF. All other housekeeping information will be actually located in the chat box just below at the, at the bottom of your screen, so please follow along. So before we kick off today's webinar, I'd like to introduce you to Marilyn Capriol, who will conduct today's opening ceremony. Marilyn is an Anishinaabe elder and Shawinigan First Nation, uh, of, of, of the First Nation, and is a founding member of the Conversation, Con Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership, Elders Lodge. She has long been an advocate on Georgian Bay water issues and a longtime volunteer on many other causes. She's also involved with the Georgian Bay Biosphere and is a member of the Indigenous Circle of the Canadian Biosphere Reserves Association. Welcome, Mindo Mayan, and thank you, Marilyn, for being here today to share your teaching and special wisdom with us. Marilyn? Um, hello, miigwech. Mishomus, Nokomusuk, Winnebago, Mino Josep, Mina Kinawaya, Nabish Quadish, no cause of Macquado dam, Shawanaka Dunjaba, I acknowledge the Creator, the grandfathers, the grandmothers, and Winnebago the namer of all living spirit. And I also greeted each and every person and your ancestors that are sitting in circle today. I'd like to share 
the messengers that came <clears throat> to visit in the last day or so. There are two four-legged Wabus and Wagosh. Wabus is a rabbit and Wagosh is a fox. And as we celebrate the lands that were given in the creation, there is always a part of transition, receiving and letting go. And we are letting go and passing the feather to the next moon cycle. That is what Wabus came to tell us. It is time to pass the feather, get ready for the Minadu, Ozens, Jesus. And what that means is a little spirit moon comes and falls just about the same time that we celebrate the winter solstice. And that grandmother moon is moving into transition along with Michel Mesquiz is the grandfather's son. But they come so close to the earth, we call that grandmother leaning her ear to listen to the heartbeat of all the things that are resting and sleeping. And how Wabus let us know that this transition is happening, was coming to stand before us. And although Earth woman was in her brown coat yesterday. Wabus let us know that that transition was coming of that purity, that rest, that sacredness. For he is already, he wears his white coat to blend with the land so that he can travel in that wise way. And in his sharing of knowledge, Further on, he stepped aside to let Wagosh walk across the path. Fox woman, fox man. And they too are so beautifully dressed in their winter coats. <clears throat> but their message is this, that the coloring of their coats is just a little bit different this year so that they may blend with the coming of the spirit over those winter months. They are so kind and loving for us, the human species, that they are sharing their knowledge from the time and beginning. That is a beautiful gift to receive from anyone and anything. And as a child's dream, if I was 65 years younger, I would be so happy on this glorious day. As it is the closing of the gathering of these sessions that we've enjoyed, listening, new knowledge, and thinking about one another, the snow has come. And in our teachings, when the snow comes or the rain comes, as we transition to leave the gathering circle. It is of kindness so that we leave no footprints behind, that no thought, no spirit is forgotten. So this morning, if I was back in that seven-year-old body, I would be outside sliding on the little hills that we could find because the beautiful snow would allow us to do that. It's not about the greatest, depth of snow, it's the fact that we've received that very gift, and it is so beautiful. So in that 65 years, our sliding toy would have been a piece of birch bark that had been harvested, but not quite to standards of the grannies. But it didn't get thrown away or put aside, it became utilized in a different manner. We as children took care of those pieces. And they were our slides. We didn't know what plastic was. 
and that too is a transition of time. So with that, my family of friends that sit here, I'd like to be respectful and mindful of thanking our beautiful men for allowing us this ethical space to come and hear each other and share smiles and the things that we cannot see, but our spirit will. I thank you for allowing us in this space between Earth Woman and Sky Man. And it is your turn to step forward in the protective coat to watch over Mother Earth. I will think about you often. And I thank you sincerely for keeping the spirit of the fire and the guidance of how the Earth is holding grandmother and grandfather and the star people. We will have a good visit today, so let us begin. Miigwech, 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 miigwech. Elder Capriol, I just want to say miigwech, merci cho, gainamik. Thank you very much for your opening and your welcome to us all. Um, your words help to remind us of the importance of the environment around us and our collective history, so thank you. Uh, I just want to start by saying, first of all, my name is Adam Chamberlain. I'm the chair of Georgian Bay Forever. I have the great honor of, of serving in that role right now. Um, and I, as I always am reminded when we meet um, as a board or as in other gatherings uh, with either among Georgian Bay Forever or with our uh, other friends and colleagues, relatives, acquaintances across Georgian Bay and those outside of Georgian Bay who have a great interest in it, uh, of the great co cooperative efforts that we see. And I just want to start by thanking all of the staff and volunteers uh, for putting together these sessions. They are far more complex and tricky to do than sometimes they appear. So thank you everybody for making it all run so smoothly and so seamlessly. Um, I just want to start by saying welcome again, and thank you for attending. Thank you for the participants who are here to listen. Uh, it's with your support and your volunteer activity uh, that our organizations are able to do the things we do and to help to protect the waters of Georgian Bay. So thank you for that. And without further ado, I'm going to pass the microphone, however I do it, by Zoom here to David Sweetnam, the Executive Director of Georgian Bay Forever. Again, thank you very much. Thanks, Adam, and welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, we have a great uh, sessions lined up today, and it's my honor to introduce the speaker for our first session, Dr. Neil Hutchinson. Neil has uh, a great depth of knowledge of uh, the waters of uh, Ontario and across Canada, and we're happy to have him with us today. Neil also is a director of Georgian Bay Forever and the chair of our science committee. And today, Neil is going to be speaking about uh, the impacts on or potential impacts on uh, our septic systems. And Neil, without any further ado, I'm going to throw it over to you. Thank you very much, David. Um, it's a great pleasure to be asked to speak to the uh, water level seminar. I'm basically, um, a septic systems are one aspect of what I've done for my career. I'm going to tell you what I have learned about septic systems over the years. And we're just going to run through septic systems 101 uh, how do they work? What do they do? And given the, um, the topic of high water levels, the concern that I have with septic systems is saturation uh, and what that does to the ability of septic systems to treat waste and the implications for Georgian Bay and septic systems. And then I want to finish off with a little bit about potable water, water levels, and climate change. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, I'm very grateful the state of Maine produced a wonderful uh, uh, slide deck on septic systems and how they work. And I'm going to uh, catch from those uh, to a great extent, anything in blue background comes from the state of Maine. But a septic system, just like a multi-million dollar wastewater treatment plant is there to protect ground and surface waters, uh, reducing the amount of nutrients and pathogens in the effluent that we produce from our own activities. No, you can produce distilled water from a highly effective treatment plant, but nobody does that. We accept the fact that we'll be reducing the level of contaminants, but not eliminating them. The septic system has several components. You see a pipe coming down um, 
down to uh, down to a tank, a pipe going out to a tile field, a drain field, and then water effluent percolating down and ultimately hitting the groundwater. And so these systems all have to be in place in order to be effective. If I can have the next slide, please. A septic system is really a microbiological reactor. Uh, most modern sewage treatment plants are, until you get to the filtration stage, we rely very much on the microorganisms, most of which originate within our own gut. When we flush the toilet, we're not only adding waste to a septic system, we're adding the treatment bacteria that will help take care of that. But microorganisms, principally bacteria, they will metabolize the organic material in our waste and the inorganic ions such as ammonia and uh, use that as a growth medium and in the process change their form into something less harmful. Next slide. Of key importance here, and we're gonna come back to this several times, so you don't have to memorize this all the first go, is the nitrogen cycle. If you look in the center of the circle, you see it highlights organic nitrogen and uh, the process of ammonification. Organic nitrogen are the proteins and the amino acids that we haven't utilized for growth that come out in our waste. They need to be uh, ammonified. Uh, bacteria converts them uh, into ammonia, which is quite toxic. And in the presence of oxygen, the bacteria convert this uh, nitrate, which is uh, ammonia, which is highly toxic, to nitrite and ultimately to nitrate, which is less toxic. Still toxic, but not as toxic as ammonia. The key factor here though, is that you need oxygen. And you'll see in the upper line of the, of the chemical reaction, oxygen is circle. I circle oxygen because if you saturate a tile field, you won't get the oxygen in that the process needs. And you need that oxygen to take, take those, that H3 off of the ammonia and convert it to O3 at the bottom right on the nitrate. In the process, you kick off five hydrogen uh, ions. That's the H plus I've circled there. Hydrogen ion is the, P, is the H in pH, it's acidity. And that's also very important for some of the reactions that we'll be talking about. Next slide, please. So the typical system uh, does its treatment in, in two stages. The first is the septic tank. We're looking at a cross section here. The effluent comes in from the left and down at the bottom is a layer of solids that build up there. Up at the top, a layer of scums, fats, greases, uh, hair conditioners, things like that, uh, that, that aren't well treated. And in between is the effluent. And um, so the tank separates these. The tank is a anaerobic. There is no oxygen in this system. All the oxygen is used up by the bacteria doing the metabolizing. And then the waste flows out to, through the right to a tile field. Next slide. The tile field is simply three, in this case, you see three pipes surrounded by gravel and sand. All that gravel and sand does is provide a reactor, a medium, a home for bacteria. It provides surface area that bacteria can cling to and absorb to and then treat the effluent, which will be trickling out of the pipes uh, down around all this medium where, where the bacteria are growing on the sand grains and metabolizing the waste that comes out. So you, you wanna keep that from plugging up and to, to make sure that the, uh, the waste can flow through it and that the oxygen can get in to do that. Next slide. So the, what happens is around these, uh, around your pipes in, in your tile field, you are seeing a biological mat growing. And this is simply a mat of bacteria, uh, fungus, protozoans that physically filter uh, particles out of the effluent and hold it there to metabolize it, and also are the home for these reactions, such as converting ammonia into nitrate. And so it consists of the solids in the effluent, mineral precipitates, we'll talk about that shortly, microorganisms, and the byproducts of their decomposition. Again, it's simply a biological home. Next slide. You'll be getting these slides afterwards and you can pour over them then, but this is really showing on the left that, that this is the chemistry of waste, what's in your, your untreated domestic wastewater. It can be weak, medium, or strong, depending on how many people are contributing to the septic tank, how much water they use, that type of thing. Uh, but you'll see phosphorus down at the bottom. Generally, we work on, on five to 10 uh, milligrams per liter parts per million as typical for sewage in Ontario. Ammonia is anywhere from the 20 to 50 range and nitrate and nitrate are zero because they don't become, uh, they don't occur until that ammonia is converted. On the right, you'll see 
uh, how much of solids and, and oxygen demand is removed in a septic tank and how much bacteria is removed. And then the second stage shows how much is removal once you get into the tile field. So, so uh, you, you do have reactions, you do have reductions in bacteria, uh, which is a concern to us, but you never eliminate it. But what happens in the tile field, again, as long as there's oxygen and it's much cooler there than it is in a human body, so the bacteria can't survive and they die off. Next slide. So again, just in review, here's your tile field, the more detailed one, the household wastewater coming down into the tank, out into the pipes, the red pipes here, uh, perforated pipes that drip the effluent down into the tile field where the bacteria take care of them. And the solids at the top, uh, that fall to the bottom of the tank in the top picture, the septic system the guy comes around every four or five years and pumps those out and takes them to a wastewater treatment plant where they are put into a conventional treatment process. Although in Ontario, in some cases, uh, we are licensed to spread this uh, septage effluent on, on uh, uh, non-food uh, non agricultural fields. But most often it is treated at a wastewater plant. Next slide. And again, just as again showing the, the, the slide you've seen before on the left, the tank, the drain field, percolation and purification of effluent that happens in the soil. And then in the, uh, it percolates down ultimately to the groundwater. Now the slide on the right shows a bit more detail and it shows um, the groundwater flow moving from left to right here, which is, the, is, is groundwater just like surface water flows uh, downhill. And so it'll make its way to the nearest stream or the nearest lake and move past the tile field in the process. And it will pick up some of the effluent, some of the contaminants in the tile field and form a plume. And there's plumes of immediate treatment, which are called proximal plumes. There's an accumulation zone, which we'll talk about that for phosphorus and different areas where different things happen. But you'll notice the dashed line halfway up. That separates the groundwater from the non-groundwater phase. And the groundwater is saturated. There's no more oxygen penetrating to there to treat any treatment. It has to be done above the aquifer, above the groundwater, where the air can get in. So you can appreciate if we move that dashed line up and, and move it over top of the three tiles there, you might have a, a situation where your tile field is saturated, in which case you won't get oxygen penetrating into that, and that will um, reduce the reactions that are treating your effluent. Next slide. So here's just an ex example of what happens in a tile field. You'll see, uh, again, a hash line uh, on the bottom that, uh, that uh, beneath the uh, six or seven pipes you'll see in cross section. And this is E. coli bacteria. And you'll see that they, they drip down, the effluent drips down into the groundwater. And then the colored zones are going from the more intense orangish color down to the weaker yellows to the right as the amount of bacteria are decreased as the groundwater uh, dilutes and moves things down, down around. Um, now, you'll, you'll see this uh, pathogenic microbes uh, organisms do not live outside the body for very long, but they can move far enough and live long enough to be of concern. A special concern, and I'm quoting here, saturated flow conditions can lead to the horizontal movement of microbes, moving them out from under the tile field and down into surface water. Unsaturated conditions are optimal and lead to greater attenuation. And although the microbes can be retained in dry soils, they can be released by surface or groundwater saturation. So if your water table rises and, and floods things, the bacteria may be released and start moving again. So you're gonna see this bottom line a lot. Treatment can be highly effective as long as an adequate unsaturated zone is maintained. Next slide. Same thing here for ammonia, convert ammonia to nitrate. Uh, you will see very high levels of the plume underneath the weeping tiles here. This is a site in Cambridge, and uh, you'll see very high levels of nitrate. All those values in the hundreds are, are nitrate, and you'll see that they do not, uh, they, they tend to persist as the plume moves from left to right uh, because they are fully oxygenated, and the only thing happening now will be dilution. And uh, if they happen to hit a, a zone with no oxygen, you might get the nitrate reduced again. The graph on the right shows the depth of the water table at the bottom and how much um, of, your, of, your, of your nitrogen is present as, as, as nitrate. You can see 
everything around from 100, from about one meter water table depth going to the right is highly effective. 100% of, of the or nitrogen is present as nitrate. That means the drain field is working. We look down towards the one meter depth where there's only one meter of, of water table, you'll see that it varies from maybe 20% of the nitrogen is present as nitrate, which indicates that you're not getting good treatment in that tile field because there's not enough oxygen coming in because the water table is higher. Treatment can be highly effective as long as an adequate unsaturated zone is maintained. Next slide. So uh, phosphorus attenuation and nitrification, we circled that oxygen before and we circled that, those, those protons before. Oxidizing conditions, that is in an unsaturated tile field where the oxygen can move to the soil and get in there, converts ammonia to nitrate. We've talked about that. That generates protons, H pluses, increases the acidity, lowering the pH. At low pH, especially that what you get in the shield, Canadian shield, because we are acidic to start with, favors reactions of soluble reactive phosphorus into insoluble mineral complexes with aluminum and iron. Phosphorus is removed from the effluent plume and won't migrate to your lake. If we look at a conventional wastewater treatment plant uh, inland, they add alum, they add aluminum to the treatment process and filter out the phosphorus after it's reacted. Here in nature, nature is doing that reaction for us. Um, and so it's very important, again, that you have the oxygen to convert your, your ammonia and ultimately to help remove the phosphorus. Next slide. Um, this is a cross section through some tile fields. Um, this just shows the concentrations of ammonia, uh, of phosphorus. In the upper left, you'll see a tile field again with the round circles. And you'll see some, uh, within the yellow, some higher numbers indicating phosphorus concentrations of four, five, seven, et cetera, very high milligrams per liter. The water is moving from left to right. Once you get out of the yellow, you're down to 0 0.07, 0 0.05. These are parts per million. This is phosphorus levels that only the best sewage treatment plants can achieve, but this tile field is doing it for us. If you look at the lower right, these are very high concentrations of mineral solids that are in the sand below the tile field. And again, they show where that phosphorus went. It's not in the groundwater anymore, it's in the soils. And much of this work is Dr. Will Robertson, who's now an emeritus professor at University of Waterloo, who spent the last 30 years studying septic systems and has shown that they can be quite effective in removing phosphorus from the tile field, which goes against what we used to think 20 years ago. Much of the mineral and phosphorus can be found within a meter of the tile field lines and all of the loading that went into this particular system could be accounted for within five meters. Again, nature and soil is doing the treatment for us as long as we have unsaturated. Next slide. And this is just another way of looking at the same things. I don't think we need to dwell on this. This is just looking uh, in lab studies. If we look at the left, we see um, unsaturated flow with the, with the low numbers uh, towards the graph and then they pop up. These are all phosphorus concentrations in the groundwater. Once you hit a saturated flow period, um, which, is, which is, is marked there, the phosphorus in the groundwater increases, you keep moving to the right and it becomes unsaturated, the phosphorus drops right off again. So this is just proving in the lab what we saw in the field and shows that treatment can be highly effective as long as an adequate unsaturated zone is maintained. Next slide. So, Dr. Robertson's uh, conclusions, um, he, he says 97% of the sites of the, of the phosphorus is removed in Canadian shield drain field sediments and 67% off shield. This is a review of 24 different septic systems. Most of the attenuation occurs very close to the infiltration pipes. It's a result of mineral reactions, sand grains, and they are stable over the long term. Um, and the removal was better or as good as or better than what you normally achieve during conventional sewage treatment. I would even add advanced sewage treatment to that. Next slide. In our view, the main threat, Dr. Robertson goes on to say, is where systems are overloaded with wastewater or the drain fields are saturated or through short circuiting by drainage ditches. So sites on clay rich sediments with shallow water tables may be more vulnerable to such failures. Now he talks about clay rich sediments here because clay is not pervious to water. 
you can imagine uh, that that Canadian shield granite, Precambrian shield granite is even less permeable. So it's much easier for a site to become saturated on Precambrian shield bedrock than it is in Southern Ontario where the soils are deeper. Next slide. So in summary, living organisms make septic systems work. You need aerobic and anaerobic environments in the right places and treatment can be highly effective as long as an adequate unsaturated zone is maintained. So high water tables risk flooding a septic system, in which case you get a breakout of bacterial contamination, faster transport in the groundwater, reduced oxygen inflow, which creates anoxic conditions, no oxygen within the tile field, that reduces the ability to break down carbonaceous materials, and uh, which are BOD or biochemical oxygen demand, Reduced nitrification, reduced oxidation of toxic ammonia to less toxic nitrate, reduced acid generation and reduced phosphorus mineralization. And, um, the, and when it goes anoxic, the, the iron and phosphate complexes become soluble. So you wanna keep your, your water tables low. Next slide. And what do you do about this? Well, the Ontario Building Code is quite clear. It says a leaching bed should not be located in an in or on an area that's subject to flooding and that may be expected to cause damage to the leaching bed or impair its operation. This means you have to have it above the water table year round. And generally speaking, you want at least 0.9 meters of unsaturated soil between the, the drain pipes and the groundwater or the rock. Where this can become a problem is most of our septic systems are gravity fed. So you tend to put your tank and your, your tile field below your house so the effluent can flow on its own to the low areas. Of course, the low areas are those that are most prone to be flooding from high rain events or high water tables. So you might run into a bit of a conflict here that you need to consider when your septic system is being sited. But we know rising water levels in Georgia Bay have occurred, can be anticipated to occur again, and septic system design and construction can be adapted to changing water levels if you choose where to put them properly. Next slide. I was asked to talk about potable water and climate change. I'm gonna talk about the, 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 what we know about climate change is increased storm severity. Our storms are gonna get more severe. This will increase the erosion from urban and agricultural areas in the watershed and bring increased suspended solids and associated contaminants downstream. Hopefully not from Muskoka where I live because we do things right here, but we know that things are at risk from uh, increased storm severity. Climate change will bring increased water levels and greater wave heights with the storms, which will increase the erosion of the soft shorelines down around Severn Sound, increase resuspension of the sediments, and with that associated contaminants, uh, bacteria, nutrients. And of course, inland, the greater the storms, the increased potential for failure of our infrastructure, of breakage and spills of pipelines and sewage bypasses. So uh, all of these are things that we need to design our infrastructure around in anticipation of climate change. And all of it we don't is gonna increase the uh, need to treat our potable water. In general, we don't consume untreated surface water. We're not supposed to, there's always nature's bacteria there, but uh, climate change will increase our need for water treatment for filtration and chlorination and the cost will increase. To me, the solution is not adaptation, but getting serious about our carbon dioxide footprint. Next slide. This is just a, a, a graph showing chloride levels on the right increasing in Muskoka Bay, in Gravenhurst Bay and Lake Muskoka, all from road salt. We add road salt to make, give our roads traction when we drop below freezing. The graph on the left in the green shows that over three months in 2017, six times we traversed the temperature drop below zero. Um, I, and then I added three and a half degrees to this, which is the projected increase by 2050 in, in, in our part of the world. And the blue lines show that we now traverse that zero degree line 13 times. So that means we need more road salt because we're going through freeze thaw cycles more often and more chloride coming into our waters, which is toxic to some of our invertebrates. So climate change is gonna bring more chloride, more road salt, more temperature excursions above and below freezing. Next change, next slide. And of course, warmer summers of climate change will favor cyanobacteria, toxic blue-green algae, earlier thermal stratification, which increases the potential for the bottom of the lake to lose its oxygen and add phosphorus, and the altered food web, 
all of which can bring us uh, increased potential for algal blooms. This is a wilderness lake in uh, Algonquin Park. We used to think algal blooms only happened in, in, in settled areas. This is a lake with no cottages, Dixon Lake in Algonquin Park with a nice uh, cyanobacterial bloom happening. And of course, once it blooms, we lose our water supply, we have to treat it, and we lose our recreational aesthetics. And again, it's a carbon dioxide problem. Next slide. So thank you all, miigwech to all. Rising water levels in Georgia Bay can be anticipated. Septic system design and construction must be adapted to changing water levels and climate change will bring an increased need for treatment of potable water. And this is my favorite watershed scientist, Paddle to the Sea, which I read in grade three and have never stopped reading. Thank you again. Welcome any questions, miigwech. Thank you, Neil. That was great. Um, we have a few questions here. Um, there were quite a number on the, the central theme of the impact on high water levels. Um, you know whether that whether that impacts the older systems more. How far from the shoreline should the septic system be? How how far back from the high water mark? Um, can you give some uh, insight into that? Yes, thank you, Rupert. Um, well, I don't think the age of the septic system is 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 as great a concern um, as long as it's pro is, is functioning properly. If your tile field's not saturated, if you haven't flooded your tile field with solids from your septic tank, the age is less important than where you put it in the first place. The building code says that the tile field can be no closer than 15 meters to the high water mark. In Muskoka, uh, they've doubled that standard and you can't be any closer than 30 meters, um, which is just providing extra protection from breakout. Um, and again, it's the distance between the tile field and the shoreline is not as important as the elevation above the shore, above the high water level. So um, you would want to find out, look at your water levels uh, in Georgian Bay compared to the uh, topography of your property and find out where the safe place would be to put your septic system. But if your septic system was built a long time ago in a low area, then it'd be more at risk than something that was not in a, it was in a higher area. Uh, what about saturation and uh, how can one test the septic bed uh, to determine saturation levels and how can one could protect it from saturation? Uh, there is no way to protect the tile field from saturation once it's in the ground. You protect it by putting it in, the, in high ground to start with and making sure you have this 0.9 meters from the Ontario Building Code between the, the, the tiles and, and groundwater. Um, so you can't really uh, protect, your, uh, protect yourself from high water levels. To test them, um, again, if you're walking on your tile field and it feels spongy, um, you got water problems. Um, if it's the middle of July and you haven't had rain for three weeks and there's bright green, uh, lines on your grass on top of your tile field, that's an indication that there's water there that the grass can, can access. Failing that, a septic system professional or a groundwater professional such as Dr. Robertson would put a, a monitoring device, simply put a pipe down through your grass and uh, into your tile field and you could actually uh, screen out the soil and you could see where the water level was rising and falling. And, um, but that, that, that's kind of a thing that, that's a more of a research level thing that we don't normally do but it, it could be done and it's quite simple to do. Uh, then we had a number of uh, questions around maintenance and inspection. Um, who, who can do, who can help with that? Uh, I guess um, in terms of uh, firms that deal with that and what the, um, what the province might do um, to investigate septic beds. Do you have any insight on those sorts of things? Um, the province used to, I'm talking back to the 70s in Muskoka and Halliburton, the Ministry of the Environment would hire summer students to go out and inspect your septic systems. Uh, at that time, they found that one or 2% of them uh, would, would be outright failures. You could see sewage bubbling up to the ground. Another 30 or 40%, up to 60% were simply too small. The house had been added onto beyond the capability of the tile field to treat it. Um, the trouble is, a visual inspection can only show you if something's failing, if there's, if there's water breaking out and uh, whether it's designed to code, because you can't really see much un unless you're saying, as I see in the bright green lawn where there shouldn't be one during a drought. Um, so a that can't really tell you how well the system is functioning. 
Uh, what can go wrong, you should get your, tile, your septic tank pumped out every four or five years because you saw the layer where the solids settled. If they don't settle fast enough, if you're putting a lot of water through, if it was built for two bedrooms and now there's four, then those solids can be flushed out into the tile field and then they will plug up the biomass and you won't get the oxygen in and you won't get good treatment. So that's an important reason to get your tile field, uh, uh, get your septic tank pumped regularly. Most licensed tile field installers would be able to tell you, uh, you know, if your system is built to code and if, it, if it's working properly from a visual point of view. But you, you need to do the chemistry and the research level uh, work that I showed you from Dr. Robertson to really understand how an individual field is working. And that's beyond the means of most of us. Can you give us some insight into the comparative um, longevity of a uh, conventional septic system and septic tanks? Good question. Um, I think the rule of thumb is, is kind of 30 years. Um, I say that knowing that my house has a tile field that's at least 40 years old and it seems to be working fine. Um, but as I said, that's only a visual inspection. Um, it's really hard. I mean, when you get your tank pumped, the inspector will tell you if the collars, if the fittings are, are proper, if the lids are, are, are tight, if the water is going where it should. And so that's something that every four or five years you might have to, uh, if the, the tank pump guy can see any problems, then you should get them fixed, but he won't be looking into the tile field. And, and as long as the tile field does not plug up and is not saturated, it should work for a long, long time. Um, so I don't really have a definitive answer to that. I think 30 or 40 years might be, you might at some point you might, you want to start thinking about replacing it, but I wouldn't say it's automatic. Um, what about technologies? Has there been a lot of change over the last 20 years? And we have a couple of specific questions. One asking about a system called EcoFlow, EcoFlow, and another one, the Waterloo, Waterloo biofilter system. Yeah. I about those. Both, both cases, I think uh, I'm very familiar with the Waterloo biofilter. You'll recall the slide where I showed all the sand grains around the tile field drain pipes. And I said that the sand grains simply provide a medium for the bacteria to grow on. In a Waterloo biofilter, it's intended for an area where you don't have uh, uh, any soil. You simply have a house, uh, a garden shed size house filled with mattress foam cut into two inch, three inch cubes. And all that does is the bacteria grow on the mattress foam instead of on soil. And that provides the surface area for the treatment. And since it's above ground, you, you just have a little fan blowing air through and you maintain an oxic system, uh, a system with oxygen in it. An EcoFlow, I believe, is the system that uses peat moss uh, as another area. And in that case, the peat moss is simply A, providing the medium on which the bacteria can grow instead of soil, and B, it, peat moss is slightly acidic to start with. Um, and um, so again, that would help with the acidification and the ultimate phosphorus removal once it got the soil. Um, there are other, other treatment systems out there, but uh, until they're licensed and approved by MOE, um, they're good things to be working on and investigating, uh, but uh, until they're proven, uh, they, they wouldn't be allowed to be installed. There's one other question on technology. What about anaerobic systems which add in oxygen in a two-chamber tank? Well, okay, anaerobic means no oxygen and more, uh, septic tanks are anaerobic because the action of the bacteria uh, on the waste consumes all the oxygen. Um, if you added oxygen to that, you would start uh, improving some of the nitrification reactions, but there's no need to do that if you have a tile field uh, where the oxygen can do that trick for you. Um, so I'm not that familiar with oxygen added systems, but it would be another way of doing what we can do with conventional systems. Okay, is there any impact from uh, uh, increased use of soaps and detergent on the efficacy of the weeping beds? Not directly. Um, actually, Craig Jowett, the man who invented the Waterloo biofilter, once told me that uh, uh, Conditioner, hair conditioner, didn't uh, didn't get treated very well. And it went, when he when he saw a tile field or a system where there's a lot of hair conditioner being used, uh, that he worried about the system getting plugged up. I say that having had three daughter, three teenage daughters in my house, so uh, I've seen a lot of hair conditioner go down. Um, but I don't think soaps and detergents themselves. 
you will recall those of us old enough in the early 70s, we legislated uh, the removal of 95% of the phosphorus from our detergents and our soaps. So um, that is taking taking the care of that problem at source. Right. Um, there is another question here about holding tanks as uh, to suggest that they're a better alternative than a class four system. Um, my knowledge of this is that um, holding tanks are no longer permitted um, for new systems, but you're grandfathered if you have one. However, municipalities can, if there is no other alternative, allow a holding tank. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, Neil? Uh, only that I, I think your interpretation is correct, Rupert. Um, that's right, they are, they are not allowed anymore. The concern was um, it's easier to knock a hole on the side of your holding tank and, and cheaper than to call in somebody to pump it out on a regular basis. And it also limits the amount of water you'd be using in a, in a, in a large family because your tank would fill up quickly. But uh, the conditions you described where you can't get a tile field in and the municipality agreed would, would be acceptable. Okay, we have time for one final question. Warmer water in the bay may mean existing sewage systems are insufficient because the nutrient outflow plus warmer water may cause eutrophication. Is this a concern that we are addressing, our organizations are addressing, and what can be done? Okay, eutrophication in Georgian Bay and our fresh waters is a function of uh, phosphorus. It always been classically been that, that if you added too much phosphorus, you would get algal blooms. Um, you saw in my presentation that a property uh, functioning septic system located in, in, on the Cambrian Shield where the soils are acid removes 97% of the phosphorus. So this, if you have good soils um, or if you import the right soils when you, when you make your tile field, you shouldn't have to worry about eutrophication as a problem because phosphorus is the issue. You'll also recall the slide I showed, showed a lovely algal bloom on a lake that did not have a single human or a single septic system on it. We are trying desperately to figure out what's causing algal blooms. In the past, you could say the higher the phosphorus, the more likelihood. And we are generally talking about 20, 30, or 40 parts per billion. Lakes with that much phosphorus would be problematic, like Lake Erie was in the 60s. Well, now we're seeing low phosphorus areas like four, five, six micrograms per liter, such as Georgian Bay, that level of nutrients, and we're still getting algal blooms. And there's an army of scientists trying to figure out why. Um, part of it is, I think, a climate change effect. Warm water favors cyanobacteria, uh, which form algal blooms. They just like warmer water. They can outcompete. They can also migrate. They can change their position in still water columns by, by going up or down. And they can sink into the deeper water where there's phosphorus, soak it up, and then pop up to the surface again where the sunlight is. So there's um, all kinds of, of different mechanisms going um, that, that may be harming um, uh, the, the system and causing algal blooms. I don't think the septic system link is, is definitive. I think the septic system, if it properly maintained, you wouldn't, shouldn't have to worry about algal blooms. Thank you so much, Neil. And thank you for all the great questions we've had. We're now gonna move on to the next topic. Um, from GBA's perspective, the purpose of this third webinar is to focus on some key issues that affect all of us and provide you with some useful information that should help you address upcoming challenges that will be caused by increased variability in weather, including more extreme storms and escalating extreme water levels. We have heard about septics and now we will move on to insurance issues. The insurance market is tightening, but we all need to protect our properties to the best of our ability and insurance is a key component of that protection. <coughs> end of Cheryl's presentation, a link will be provided in the chat to a list of resources for you, which will be helpful. Cheryl Evans is the Director of Flood and Wildfire Resilience at the Intac Center on Climate Adaption at the University of Waterloo. Cheryl has over 20 years of experience in this field, and we are privileged to receive the benefit of her knowledge today. Thank you, Cheryl. Please take it away. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for having me here today. Um, and I, I would just like to encourage everyone to think of this as the beginning of a conversation. Um, the Intact Center is, is committed to providing ongoing support. And I have personally just moved to, uh, to Meaford. Um, 
within the last year and a half and I'm looking for volunteer opportunities. So, so please keep me posted uh, professionally or personally if you'd like additional assistance. Next slide, please. So today, uh, what I'm going to be talking about, first of all, is what is the Intact Center? Then we're gonna quickly summarize the impacts of a changing climate on the Georgian Bay region. Then we're going to help uh, provide some tools and tricks for identifying your home and property's unique risks. We're going to talk about uh, some options for managing risks. We're going to give a little bit of information about uh, insurance consideration when you're appraising your different uh, risks and opportunities to mitigate risks. And then I'll point to some free training and action-focused resources, and then we'll have a bit of time for questions. Next, please. So first of all, the Intact Center is an applied research center with a national focus. We're headquartered at the University of Waterloo. Uh, we were launched in 2015 with a gift from Intact Financial Corporation. And something important to note is that we operate independent of all funders and uh, um, we do not benefit from the sale of, of any products or services. So um, I do not represent the insurance industry. We, uh, we operate independent and um, we receive funding from various sources. So that's something really important to clarify. Um, when we talk about insurance today, I'll often be referring you to speak directly with your insurance uh, representative because I do not represent insurers directly. So the Intex Center has two main goals. The first is to change the national conversation about climate change to address uh, climate adaptation. We don't wanna just talk about uh, managing carbon dioxide uh, levels in the atmosphere. We also wanna talk about adapting to the changes that are underway and that will continue to happen. And we are a very, very practical, forward-looking, um, positive organization. Our other main goal is to help homeowners, communities, and business to, businesses to reduce risks associated with climate change and extreme weather events. So today we're, we're gonna focus on understanding risks uh, and how to, how to take action to protect yourselves. Next, please. So we, we started out as a, a flood risk adaptation organization. We've now branched into uh, looking at risks related to extreme heat, wildfire, et cetera. But uh, we have the most experience dealing with uh, flood, looking at risks and adapting to uh, the, the, the perils related with various types of flooding. Um, so when you receive our resource sheet at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to uh, connect to our website and see all these various different resources here. Um, the, one of the resources you'll like best is a summary of best practice actions called Under One Umbrella. And what will, you'll really find interesting is coming out within the next few weeks, it's a, a coastal resilience guide. So it looks at water levels, managing flooding and erosion. And next year, I'm excited to participate in the development uh, of a guide that will talk about uh, adapting to climate change uh, in, in river and uh, uh, lakes um, uh, sis systems and also looking at how we can integrate the use of natural infrastructure when we're considering our options for managing flooding and erosion. Next, please. So you can just click through. Um, okay, so one of the things I like to talk about first is helping people to just take stock, to understand what's happening now, and what's going to be happening in the future. So you can boldly stare the information in the face and then de decide what you're going to do based on all of the information that's available. So this is a very good comprehensive summary report put out by the government of Canada in 2019. Most of you will be familiar with this. It's called Canada's Changing Climate Report. You can dig through it. Uh, at a high level, it has three main messages. So number one is Canada's climate has warmed and will warm further in the future, driven by human influence. Number two, past, both past and future warming in Canada is on average about double the magnitude of global warming. And number three, warming is effectively irreversible. We can slow it, but we can't go back. 
So <clears throat> in terms of the impacts across Canada, they're all going to be a little bit different depending on where you go. And that's a really important message. Um, so it's important to understand your local risks and what you can do about them. But on overall in Canada, we'll be looking at more extreme heat, less extreme cold, because we've got warming overall, shorter seasonal coverage of snow and ice, melting of glaciers and permafrost, and rises in sea level. Um, what that will impact, what it will result in, is the intensification of certain extremes. So we'll see more intense rainfall and urban flooding. We'll see increased coastal flooding, uh, in, in, including on, um, on lakes such as Georgian Bay, and increased severity of heat waves, and increased risk of drought and forest fire. Next, please. So what this chart does is it looks at what's already been happening and what are the impacts that we're already seeing. So the insurance companies in Canada all pool their data together. And when there is a cat loss known as a catastrophic loss, so a loss that is $25 million or more for one event, so really big events, flood, fire, hail, et cetera, it goes onto this chart and they've started charting this information since 1983. So the, the trend line is moving upward, obviously. Uh, one, some of the key takeaways here are that from 1983, when they started tracking this information, to 2008, the insurance companies could estimate that they would be paying out altogether between two and $400 million a year with these cat losses. And then in 20, 2009, the, um, the losses started to, to uh, trend upward quite significantly. And since then, we've only had one year, 2015, where the losses have altogether been below a billion dollars. So the losses now can be expected to be on average about 1.8 to $2 billion a year. And we've seen um, significant losses, as you know, unfortunately, in BC this, uh, well, this entire year. Um, so it's likely that those losses for 2021 will be off this chart for next year, unfortunately. Next. So um, what, what we're already seeing as well, because we looked at losses for insurance, uh, it, something to note about those insured losses is that uh, for every dollar, that insurance companies cover, there are three to four dollars that are not covered by insurance companies that are borne by governments and individuals. So that's um, that's a, an important point to make as well. And what we've already seen happening uh, in Georgian, the Great Lakes region, um, is that from 1951 to 2017, we've seen average temperature increases up to 0.3 Fahrenheit we've seen an average uh, number of frost-free days up per year of uh, 16. We've seen total precipitation go up, but one of the biggest things about that, that precipitation is it's tending to uh, result in um, uneven distribution of precipitation. So more extreme weather events, more extreme downfall, more, it, more extreme rainfall, uh, hail, uh, freezing rain, um, snow events. Uh, so instead of it being sort of more smooth, uh, it is coming in bigger events, uh, followed by quieter events, followed by bigger events, bigger yo-yoing, let's say. Next, please. So this is just down the street from my house, unfortunately. So when you look at uh, impacts predicted by 2100, so looking future, future uh, wise, because you don't wanna just look at what's happened, you wanna look at uh, forward. Uh, the predictions are an increase in the average temperature by about 3.3 degrees Celsius uh, by the end of the century and more precipitation on average but overall drier in the summer and more in the winter. And again, these more extreme events. Um, so the impacts include 
warmer temperatures that may lead to more winter rain and earlier peak stream flows. So one thing about these uh, milder winters as well is you're going to see an increase of freezing rain, which can really have impacts with, with loss of power, or trees down, etc. You'll see more frequent summer droughts that could affect soil moisture, surface water levels, and groundwater supply. Uh, next, please. There's just a few points there, great. Um, the, there is a projected increase in droughts, severe storms, and flooding events that may amplify the risk of erosion, sewer overflow, interference with transportation, uh, flooded out roads, for example, that are impassable, and flood damage. And there'll be greater variations in lake levels. So not only um, higher, but also lower. Next, please. So that's a lot of information. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is, uh, can, it, can you click down a little bit? You can just click through it all, thank you. Um, so the bad news is that climate change is real, it's happening and will continue to impact Canada. Climate change is contributing to significant increases in home flood losses. Residents are largely unaware of their risks and residents commonly misunderstand their insurance coverages. So the part of the, the main reason why I'm here today is to share the good news. So the good news is that a variety of free resources are available to help residents understand your home and property's unique risks, understand your options for managing risks, take actions to limit damage, and if you, if you have flood damage, to build back better. Don't build back the same way, or you will expect the same damages again. Next, please. Okay, so this is where we get to the point in the uh, presentation where I sort to start to provide some information that might be new to people um, to, give, to give everyone the basics. So did you know that the majority or 60% of water claims are caused by leaking appliances and water pipes? That's actually your highest likelihood of damages in a home. The remainder or 40% are split between sewer backup, sump failure, or overland flooding caused by heavy rainfall. So any water that comes in over the ground, over land and, and goes in through windows, doors, uh, cracks in the foundation above, uh, the, above the ground. And all Canadian homes are at risk of flooding from those risks. So that, that is actually what our center initially was focused on, was these rainfall and sewer backup related risks. And only about 5% of Canadian homes are exposed to additional structural damage risks associated with flooding and erosion from river, rivers, lakes, and oceans. Next, please. Okay, so this is, uh, I think there was a survey done by University of Waterloo, a different research center. There is only 50% of people that actually have a really good understanding of what their insurance covers and they tend to overestimate what they're covered for as it pertains to flooding. So this is a shout out to have a, a chat with your insurance uh, representative. So anyway, in, in Canada, uh, the insurance industry refers to flooding as water damage. They don't really talk about the word flood insurance, but we will just use that category. But the insurance companies refer to it as water damage. So what's typically covered in a comprehensive policy, so if you have a home, uh, you're, you're covered sort of a, a package of, of coverages. And what is typically covered is sudden and accidental damage caused by escape from, of water from plumbing, pipes, appliances, and fixtures. Notice the words sudden and accidental. If something is foreseeable and predictable, that is not something that insurance companies are um, designed to cover for. So it's up to residents to do maintenance on a regular basis. The optional coverages that have limited availability depending on risk uh, may be available for sudden and accidental damage <clears throat> caused by sewer backup flooding, groundwater flooding, and flooding from water and sewer lines and overland flooding. I added that one last because we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Next, please. Oh, go back, please. Thank you. So, uh, so 
overland flooding, as I was mentioning, is if you can imagine water coming down either from uh, rainstorms, snowmelt, rivers overtopping their banks, um, the water lands on the ground and flows by gravity uh, to low points. So if water comes into a house from above the ground, the insurance companies refer that to refer to that as overland flooding. So in Canada, we are way behind many, many other countries in providing overland flood insurance coverages. The only, uh, the time that insurance coverage became available for overland was 2015 in response to the, the catastrophic flood losses that were happening, that happened in 2013 in, in Calgary. Um, the insurance companies started to say, okay, we need to do something to help people address these risks. So um, since 2015, overland flood insurance coverage is now quite widely available at affordable prices for low to medium risk properties. So approximately 5% of homes are considered by the insurance companies to be at high risk of flooding and are generally not eligible for affordable overland insurance because they are within a floodplain of a river, on the coast of an ocean or a lake, or in an area with the history of regular sewer backup flooding. Next, please. So a specific type of overland flooding is called storm surge uh, insurance coverage. So that's something that the people on this call will be very interested in, in asking specifically their insurance representatives about. Um, storm surge flooding can present a significant risk in coastal regions around lakes and oceans where extreme weather patterns have intensified with the change in climate. Optional storm surge coverages for high-risk property owners have been available from a small number of companies since August 2018. Uh, that's from a, a, a cooperator's um, online article that I found. So um, in Ontario and Alberta, some insurers are now including storm surge coverage in all comprehensive policies. So one of the key takeaways here as well is that insurance is constantly evolving. What your present insurance company will cover is, <clears throat> uh, is going to change from year to year. And uh, what is generally available in the market, excuse me, <clears throat> is also going to change from year to year. So you need to do your research and keep asking questions. Now, thank you. So, some people also think, okay, if I can't get private insurance coverage, there must be flood insurance or some kind of insurance coverage available through the government. So just to give a little bit of a summary about that. So government recovery assistance is available after large scale disasters. So you'll, you'll hear for a call from the federal government for support, uh, out in BC, for example, this year, unfortunately, for, for fires and for, for floods. So the Government Disaster Financial Assistance Arrangement, DFAA program in Canada is only available to those who do not have access to overland flood insurance or storm surge coverage by private insurance at a reasonable rate. It's, it's considered a, a last resort. The DFAA is not a viable alternative to private insurance as it is used as a last resort to cover from large to recover from large scale disasters. If insurance is available and affordable, but a property owner does not purchase it, they are not eligible for government assistance. Uh, DFAA coverage is only available for primary residences and is not uh, for properties such as cottages or second homes. So something important to remember about this is that this is for very large scale events. Um, say that the massive flood flooding that's going on right now in BC, if there was a relatively uh, focused and con concentrated storm surge event in Georgian Bay, uh, this would not trigger government financial assistance. Uh, it's, it would be considered too small. Um, 
uh, an occurrence. So the this the, the so DFA coverage. The other thing is um, <clears throat> the federal government recognizes that this is a, a significant challenge. That there are a lot of people. There are five percent of people who are in high risk zones. They've made their investments. They have their family. They have their uh, their um, their lives in in uh, integrated into these areas. And so the federal government presently is working um, on a task force on flood insurance and relocation. And they're also working on uh, collaborating with Indigenous Service Canada and Indigenous people in Canada to review their options to create a high risk insurance pool to provide affordable overland insurance coverage to high risk properties. Uh, Next. So I encourage people to, uh, to gather as much information as you can. So understand your insurance coverages. We have a list of the key questions you can ask. You can ask for premium discounts for taking action to reduce your risk or building with flood resistant mater materials and ask your insurance provider about building back better. If you do have a loss, uh, work with them to build back better instead of just building back the same. Next, please. So some other information that's going to be critically important to you is finding out what information is available through your local conservation authority. You can find uh, local flood risk messages that you can sign up for, flood risk mapping. Um, you can work with them. You must work with them uh, for regulation and permits related to construction, renovation, shoreline, riverbank amendments, and safe egress. So if you build somewhere and there's a big storm, you have to prove that you can safely get in and out of that area so that you're not trapped. Uh, locally, we've got Gray Sobble, we've got an Ottawa Saga Valley Conservation Authority that, where there are individuals available to help you. Um, areas not serviced by the CA, you can approach Ministry of Environment. I've, I've provided a link. And the local municipality also helps through development approvals and bylaws and on the ground flood response. Next, please. So I see that we're getting low on time. I just want you to know that there is a free on-site flood risk assessment checkup that you can do yourself. It takes five to 10 minutes. Uh, it looks primarily at flood risk from, from rainfall flooding. Uh, it will give you a confidential flood report. So to help you take action. Next, please. We've also got a three steps document that helps you understand one step at a time, anywhere from simple maintenance, things that you need to do to, to retain your insurance, uh, to simple upgrades from going to the hardware store and more uh, complex upgrades that you can do uh, with qualified and, uh, professionals, government and insurance reps to help you get um, ready uh, one step at a time. Next, please. So, we talked about rainfall flooding. Um, that's important, but for this area, you wanna look at what are the other types of options available to you. So the, the work that we have done with rainfall flooding uh, looks at dry flood proofing. So that the idea there is to keep water out or defend your property. So we have put together some resources about that and I'll talk about temporary barriers in a minute. But if you are in a property that is going to be regularly flooded, um, you might look longer term about thinking about wet flood proofing. And I know that in conversation with the conservation authorities, they are prepared to help people look at these options as well. That essentially means adapting your buildings to understand that water will come in and water will come out. Simple things like putting with a structural engineer, putting flood vents on a, a floor that is not going to be used or raising your building so that if water comes, it can just leave and it won't damage your building. Uh, the other option of course is moving buildings higher up on your lot or uh, moving out altogether. So your risks, you're gonna look very carefully at you know, upcoming climate change, your unique flood and erosion risks, the severity of your risk, your budget, and your options for insurance coverage. 
Next, please. So we have a great resource that looks at temporary barriers because one of the first steps you can take is just make sure that water stays out uh, for as long as possible. And so we have a list of really great barriers for the openings, so your windows, doors, but also around your property. And it's sort of looking beyond sandbags. What can people use? Great resource uh, that's available as well. Next, please. So this is just put to, um, uh, to, to put your mind thinking about uh, future collaborations and concepts. So the way that we're managing flood and erosion risk has evolved and it will continue to evolve. So we are uh, originally attempting to control natural erosion processes by straightening and hardening riverbanks and coastlines. It was considered best practice for many decades. And then from 1990, a growing number of governments and not-for-profit organizations started to integrate the use of softer management techniques called nature-based solutions that mimic nature to manage flooding and erosion by restoring natural processes. And uh, so future looking, this is going to be more common. So uh, whereas we have done piecemeal lot by lot erosion management approaches, uh, we can see them widely on the shore. One, one property has a very different management approach than others, which can uh, sort of transfer their damages to their neighbors. Uh, with government guidance and oversight in many jurisdictions, lot level management decisions are now being guided to consider community level or watershed scale impacts. So this is really exciting and I, I look forward to contributing to this uh, amendments or these better, uh, better approaches in the future. Next. So uh, this is just a slide about softer versus harder uh, techniques. And you'll see around uh, the bay, for example, you can use softer techniques like vegetation where you've got a really uh, limited slope and you've got lots of room. But with the harder gray techniques, um, you often sort of integrate those more often uh, when there is living, there is limited space. Um, so next, please. So. There is so much amazing learning to have. Lots of local organizations are doing this work. Some really interesting presentations and sort of how-to guides are available across Canada. One is from Ecology Action Center. One is from Green Shores for Homes program. You can see some of the work that they've done in these slides. Um, the links that I've put in even have presentations that talk about what homeowners can do to consider green options and start to work with their conservation authorities to make these things happen. Next, please. So we are constantly developing new resources and something that I would encourage people to consider is uh, to look on our website, homesubprotect.ca. We've just developed a new flood and erosion protection training program. It's focused on PEI residents, but it's, it's broadly applicable across Canada and it's free. I think people would enjoy that. We've got sort of the how-to checklists uh, and questions to ask your insurance provider. We've got fact sheets and videos. We've got the free checkup app. And uh, we've also got a available municipal subsidy information that can help you um, fund some of these upgrades. And you can always uh, follow us on social media, on Twitter and Facebook to see uh, what we're up to and to contact us as well. Next, please. This is just uh, down the street from my home. And I wanted to thank everyone for, for having me here. And like I said, it's the beginning of a conversation. Uh, and I look forward to uh, your questions and continuing to provide support in, the, in my new local home here. Cheryl, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful rundown, packed full of information, as a result of which we don't have that many questions. <laughs> I think you've answered them all already. Um, there are a couple of questions on the cost of insurance. Why, why is it so costly and whether the recent flooding in BC will affect insurance rate? Can you, can you deal with that? Oh, um, so that's a great question. Certainly with um, the, the chart that I showed you, the catastrophic loss claims chart, um, you can see that the increases in uh, losses for insurance companies have been rising dramatically. Now in Canada, 
Uh, our insurance companies are for-profit organizations. They essentially need to balance their books. So when their losses start to increase, they need to increase their, um, their costs to try to balance their budgets or they, they can't stay in business. So it's a direct reaction to the increased losses in the markets. It is possible that, um, that the, the BC costing or BC losses will impact Ontario, but I think it tends to be more regionally specific. The insurers are getting more and more granular lately about um, assessing the risk to the individual property um, and basing the risk on the basing the premiums on the specific risk at the property. So um, my guess would be the BC losses would not uh, impact something nearly as much as say a, a big loss on Georgian Bay. That would be more, um, more like far more likely. And they're also really looking at opportunities to give people risk adjusted premiums. So if you can reduce your risk, they are excited about giving discounts because it's competitive. They want to keep your business. Um, so that's something to think about as well. Great conversations can uh, clarify a lot for you. There's a couple of uh, similar questions here. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, specifically, is there some insurance cover for docks and uh, for high winds and high water, and high water resulting from high winds for cottages? I think those are really linked. Can you throw any insight on that? So, um, there is absolutely coverage for that. Now, whether you'll be eligible or not, or whether you like the price that's available, um, that is one thing. Uh, I was talking about comprehensive insurance, so that would not be something that would be uh, covered on in comprehensive insurance. It would be an optional coverage that you would purchase. So you would speak to your insurance um, representative. And one of the things to really, really remember is insurance companies are constantly evolving their products or constantly changing um, their pricing, changing what's available. So if you don't like what you're hearing from your current insurance company, uh, ask another insurer, do an online search, look for the, the best products, the best rates that will help you because um, you don't you don't have to settle for for what a company one company is giving you. Um, do your your shopping. Um, and when I was unhappy with my insurance company a couple of years ago, I told my insurance broker. Um, they conveyed that information actually to the insurance company, and my concerns plus those of other people related to not having adequate overland insurance coverage. Uh, in response to that, they actually included overland coverages as part of the comprehensive policy the next year. So I can't understate how important these tough questions are because they influence the industry. Thanks very much. Um, other question, is there any hope of insuring an old poorly maintained cottage without renovations, or maybe property liability coverage? So for any property, you need to have basic um liability coverages and for in for um flood and fire uh you'll have to you'll have to speak directly with your insurance uh representative and and shop around um <clears throat> each case will be a little bit different but definitely uh be your own advocate and and uh and keep asking the tough questions Okay, there'll be a link in chat to some resources on the GBA website and our, our insurer rice insurance. So have a look at that for some of the questions that we've had. Um, underground, another question, underground water level is affecting our home. This summer we had water in the basement from heavy and frequent rains. I think that's been covered, but is there any additional um, messaging you can give to that question? Um, so there's a few things. Uh, when, you, when you look at your home, you can do this home flood protection checkup because that, that does um, relate to uh, rainfall uh, related flooding and that can contribute to um, groundwater increase levels right around your home. So you can do that. Um, certainly you want, if you do have a sump pump, 
for example. You want to make sure you have uh, that that's working. You're testing it spring and fall. Also, that you have a backup sump pump and a backup battery that you're testing. Um, one thing I always say to people is don't think about if water enters your home, think about when it enters a home. So think ahead. If there is water, one of the best things you can do is uh, reduce your risk. So um, move any of your most valuable belongings out of the area that it, it can be damaged, uh, either raise them up or get them out. And it's not just valuables, it's also things that can cause contamination more damage. So if you have uh, chemicals, pesticides, oil, uh, like a gas tank in a spot that might tip and spill, please, please raise those up or get them um, into a, a higher location because that can greatly increase the, the damage to not only your property, but if say, if that water is pumped outside, just think of the, the gasoline impacts on the, on the local uh, wildlife and, and water. It can be catastrophic. So think ahead and protect yourself. Thanks for great answers. Uh, David, over to you. Yeah, great advice and excellent information. And again, we will be providing the documents in the thank you emails as well to folks so that they can avail themselves of all of these great resources. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the, the event, we are working in collaboration with Severn Sound Environmental Association, and I'm very pleased to introduce Aisha Shandet, uh, who is a water scientist with the Severn Sound Environmental to introduce our next topic and our next speaker. Over to you, Aisha. Thanks so much, David. So our third and final speaker is Nicola Crawhall. Nicola's consulting firm, Westbrook Public Affairs, led the secretariat that developed the Action Plan 2030, which she'll speak a bit about today. She is the former deputy director of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative and a coalition of uh, Canadian and US mayors who work together to protect the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. Nicola has served as senior policy advisors to two Ontario ministries of environment and has also served as senior environmental policy advisor for the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. And I'll turn it over to Nicola. Great, thanks very much. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Action Plan 2020-2030. Uh, this is uh, a plan, uh, if you wouldn't mind um, advancing the slide, there you go. Uh, so this was a plan that was the um, the brainchild of um, five organizations, four of which are um, binational organizations. And what they saw on the U.S. side uh, was uh, the U.S. Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. It was um, a huge undertaking on the U.S. side that uh, delivered about um, 10, I think up now $10 billion in funding for Great Lakes restoration work, much of it that was directly, uh, that directly benefited shoreline communities. So they wanted to provide the federal government with a blueprint to launch a Canadian version of the US uh, GLRI. Uh, and so that was the uh, primary, um, and I should say that, uh, that Environment Canada uh, provided $400,000 in funding towards completing the action plan. So the uh, main goals of the uh, of the uh, what we called the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Collaborative uh, were to integrate uh, Great Lakes and St. Lawrence into a vision of uh, what it, what could be in the future by 2030 with the right um, coordination and investment uh, that we would increase investment, uh, like I said, inspired by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and uh, to think of innovative approaches, not the same old, same old, but some uh, different ways of doing things. And uh, importantly, to align the governments, could the federal, provincial, and local authorities all work together. Uh, and it had to be a product of engagement with those people on the shoreline, the stakeholders, the experts, and First Nations. And so this is, uh, I will just highlight some of the uh, challenges, but. Uh, the, in the uh, climate change area, but there were four areas that the federal government asked the collaborative to look at. Uh, climate change, beaches, nutrients, and toxics and harmful pollutants. So on climate change, when we began consulting stakeholders across the Canadian side of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Basin, 
many told us of the dramatic effects of climate change on their shoreline communities. Uh, we started in 2017, and that was a year that had unexpectedly high water levels, uh, which created havoc and destruction along long stretches of the Great Lakes. And while this wasn't welcome, of course, uh, it did provide us with a, an opportunity to get some essential information about where the impacts of high water levels were being felt uh, most acutely. Uh, so to document this, we interviewed experts in hard hit areas um, and, and um, local authorities as well in each of the Great Lakes and in Georgian Bay. Uh, and we also consulted uh, the um, uh, Severn Sound Environment Association. Uh, and so uh, we focused uh, our efforts in these areas that you can see on the screen, and in particular, the southern end of Georgian Bay around tiny township, Penetanga Trail, and this really back with the whole time. And what we found was a common uh, to these different areas um, in every lake uh, was that at high water level times, uh, they experienced acute erosion caused by the water itself, intense wave and wind energy, battered shoreline, uh, caused extensive property damage. Um, and uh, what we also found was a patchwork of responses. Uh, so in most cases, the municipality and conservation organizations were doing their best to coordinate responses, but there was little money to devote to the cause and little coordination with the federal and provincial governments. Uh, so, in the absence of that coordination and, and, and investment and uh, funding available, individual property owners were going ahead with their own, uh, with their own works and, and, um, and swallowing the cost. So, uh, we heard of people, you know, paying 20, 30, 40 thousand uh, dollars to build a wall to protect their property from uh, the waves that were smashing closer and closer to their, to their cottages or to their homes. Um, and then quickly finding that hard barriers on one property are easily breached through their neighbor's property. Um, so these individual responses, though well-meaning, uh, were no match for Mother Nature. As we've seen uh, most tragically in Abbotsford just recently, water will go where water wants to go. And so uh, we turned our uh, minds to what was happening in the US. Uh, as I mentioned, there were a number of um, of American uh, binational organizations involved in this exercise and learning from the experience of uh, shoreline municipalities, property owners, conservation organizations. Um, you know, we had heard that there was a lack of funding to prevent damage to shorelines and a lack of federal provincial coordination. Uh, so looking to the US, uh, we saw that there is a nationally funded coastal zone management program, which has been in place for 50 years and it coordinates government action and funding to protect and restore shorelines in eight zones in the Great Lakes region on the US side. So we saw this as an excellent model for the Canadian side that would address both the funding gap and that government uh, coordination gap. And so if you could just uh, flip the slide, that is why um, one of the action plans principal recommendations was to establish and fund shoreline resiliency priority zones um, and to establish management teams in each of these zones. And so you can see our proposed list of priority zones was based on uh, a scan of stretches of shoreline that were seriously impacted in that 2017 high water level uh, period. Uh, and again, were impacted in 2019. Uh, I should point out this is a provisional list and there may be more of these zones that are needed to be identified. So this recommendation in our report was by far the biggest ticket item in the action plan because we recognized how much uh, needed to be invested in these shorelines to set up the management teams, of course, but to replace buffers and dikes in the case of Lake Ontario, um, around Chatham-Kent and Leamington to protect the high sandy cliffs of Upper Lake Huron uh, to clean up a toxic waste site close to the shoreline in the case of Fort William First Nation on Lake Superior. And in the case of Georgian Bay, we recognize that the hardening of the shoreline due to rapid development uh, was altering the dynamic of the watershed. 
It was reducing infiltration, causing drainage and flooding problems. So building further back in the shoreline and protecting naturalized shorelines uh, would not only protect shorelines, it would reduce flooding inland, uh, reduce the risk of sewage bypasses, and would protect shoreline properties in infrastructure as well. So there were a number of recommendations uh, around that. Uh, most controversial of all, and I think um, our previous speaker just spoke to this, is uh, when we talked to the folks in Chatham, Kent and Leamington, who were really um, probably the most impacted by this, this high water level, was that uh, they understood that there were some properties that were just no longer viable. Uh, they had been uh, flooded repeatedly. Uh, they had um, extensive damage. And in Chatham, Kent, uh, the, uh, the head engineer there said the municipality was starting to engage property owners in the difficult conversation about what he called retreat. And so, I've spoken mostly about high water levels uh, so far, but there are a number of different threats along the shoreline uh, that are being exacerbated by climate change. Uh, there are periods of low water levels that I'm sure many of you have experienced in previous years. There is that strong wind and wave action that causes erosion. Uh, sudden spring thaws are particularly problematic because the land is usually still partially frozen in the spring and can't absorb the water from the thaw. So combine it with rain and it creates a perfect storm, which is what occurred uh, during the Richelieu River flooding in 2011. And ice jams can also cause massive damage and flooding like what occurred in 2018 in Brantford around uh, uh, along the Grand River, uh, which caused the overtopping of the flood protection dike. Uh, so if we just turn to the next slide, Another important uh, recommendation in our uh, report was increased investment in LIDAR and floodplain mapping. LIDAR, light detection and ranging mapping, is a method of uh, generating uh, georeferenced spatial information about the shape and the surface characteristics of a given area. And there have been advancements in LIDAR mapping systems that allow for examining uh, natural and built environments across a wide range of scales. Uh, with greater accuracy and precision. And the US um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, their Coastal Services Center has used LIDAR extensively to create a massive digital coast map for the US Great Lakes and their oceanic coasts. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that we need in Canada because it can help both with restoration work, uh, but also with emergency response. Uh, so other watershed organizations like SEA uh, that have followed floodplain mapping along rivers and creeks, um, less so along shorelines, Great Lakes shoreline. Uh, so there's a lot of work being done there. Um, the problem is that much of this floodplain mapping information is outdated. There's been a lot of changes uh, since the 1970s when they were first developed. And it's been estimated that updating them will cost at least $75 million. Um, and then there's the completing the coastal floodplain mapping, which will cost even more. So that was, uh, that was a big recommendation in our report to uh, update that information to help everybody uh, understand literally the lay of the land. So uh, on the screen, you can see this um, image of what LIDAR does and, and the, the level of detail that it can provide uh, when, it, um, when it's, uh, reading the um, uh, the lay of the land. Okay, so uh, if we could just switch to the next slide. Uh, I'm just going to touch on access to climate change data and information. So uh, we thought that this was particularly inform uh, important. And, and I don't mean that there isn't a lot of climate data out there. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of climate data out there but it's access in a format that actually helps local authorities uh, do something about it. Uh, so there has been some progress since this recommendation was made. For instance, the provincial government and the Ontario government announced that it's developing a provincial climate assessment. 
It's not clear yet what level of granularity that assessment will be in, but it may help with broader trends and scenarios. Uh, so you could probably see what some of the trends are around uh, Georgian Bay. Uh, also in the US, GLISA is an institute at the University of Michigan uh, that provides information that's specific to the Great Lakes. And that's really important because it takes into consideration the lake effect uh, on weather patterns. Most of these global scenarios, uh, or all of the global scenarios, do not take in to effect, uh, into uh, account that very, very important lake effect. And federally, uh, there is the Canadian Climate Data and Scenarios site, provides vital climate information, and they have a federal climate services support desk uh, to help navigate that. But like I said, still much of the information available is directed at climate experts rather than putting it in a format that's understandable and usable by local communities. Uh, so we do want uh, some improvements to, uh, to that information. And, and what do I mean by climate information? Uh, well, you can see on the next slide um, that it includes things like uh, water levels, uh, water temperature, uh, air temperature, uh, wind and wave action, ice cover, uh, precipitation, evaporation, and runoff, uh, and, and groundwater. Uh, so once you have that information, um, you can make some informed decisions. Uh, but that information is not readily available um, in all areas. Then if we could just go to the next slide. Uh, our previous speaker uh, spoke about this um, in quite a lot of detail, uh, but we had a, a recommendation around the importance of natural infrastructure solutions. Uh, and that's because uh, along the shoreline, you know, it's called the ribbon of life uh, for a reason. It is such an essential part of the life cycle of so many species, such an important um, meeting point in, in watersheds. Uh, because the ribbon of life plays a crucial role uh, also in filtering out pollutants, uh, reducing water runoff that sends road salt and gasoline and fertilizer into the water. Um, and, you know, when that fertilizer and other nutrients go into the water, it causes toxic blue-green algae to form. Uh, so you can't swim in the water, you can't, your pets can't go in the water, and uh, excessive weed growth. So it's pretty unpleasant stuff. So if you can add a natural buffer between your home and the water, <clears throat> you're actually protecting uh, the health for the ecosystem, but also for your family and your pets going into the water. And uh, the previous speaker spoke a bit about, you know, what, what does a naturalized um, shoreline look like? You can see on the screen right now the difference between the before and after. Uh, you um, add vegetation to the shoreline. Lots of native trees and shrubs act as a buffer. They absorb the nutrients and the contaminants I was talking about. They trap sediments so that uh, you don't get that erosion effect. Uh, and it encourages infiltration uh, for when you get those higher water levels. So it's all so much prettier and cheaper and uh, then hardening your shoreline. Uh, so. Uh, I just wanted to take you through uh, those recommendations uh, to give you a flavor of the report. Um, just want to thank you for your interest in the report. It was submitted to Environment Canada and Climate Change uh, in 2020, and uh, we, uh, we are anticipating that some of these recommendations, we're hoping, uh, will be considered as they create the uh, Canada Clean Water Agency uh, that is uh, meant to be uh, uh, coming forward um, soon. It's, it was uh, in the throne speech again. So uh, that uh, Canada Water Agency uh, will obviously have um, some responsibilities around the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence that, uh, that we may be able to influence with some of these recommendations in the action plan. So thanks very much for your time. Great. Thanks, Nicola. We'll take questions in a second. We just wanted to jump in with kind of a, the big picture of what are the benefits of long-term planning versus executing short-term solutions. So now we're over the three webinars trying to give you the sense that change is coming and in many ways change is already here. And the benefits, uh, if you go to the next slide, of thinking long-term rather than executing just short-term kind of responses to immediate things. First of all, there, it's more cost-effective to think long-term. 
you can maintain the safe use of property instead of getting hit by uh, events. Uh, avoid rapid onset disasters. So anticipating these things, as Cheryl said, it's not if water's gonna get into your home, it's when it's going to get into your home. Uh, and then avoiding the cost of multiple future disasters. So things that keep happening over and over again. And the whole idea of building back better uh, instead of building back the same way that Cheryl mentioned. Incremental changes you can plan for uh, if you, you know, stage out all of the changes that you think you may need to make to increase the climate resiliency and protect your family and your buildings. You can plan for that over time. And it also, as risk assessments change going forward into the future, it also gives you that ability to adapt your plan to take uh, those changes into account. So as it progresses, you can see how this, the risk assessments are increasing or decreasing in the area and you can evaluate them appropriately. And finally, there are going to definitely be developing technologies that, that will come available in the market to help uh, property owners and uh, coastal property owners uh, adapt to or, or make these changes. And so you'll be able to take advantage of those developing technologies as well. Next slide over to Rupert. Yeah, so moving on to some specifics. Um, and we this we touched on this at the uh, one of the earlier webinars, but uh, grip and concrete docks um, are likely to be major issues going forward with increasing water levels variability. Um, for instance, the uh, next extreme uh, water event could be uh, levels lower than 2013. And in 2013, we saw many uh, crib docks eventually essentially become unusable because they were just too far off the water level. Um, so this will cause access issues and significant practical problems for municipal marina and other shoreline businesses. Conversely, in 2019-20, uh, um, many crib and concrete docks were simply uh, flooded. They, the water came way above their level in some cases or just above the level. Either way, uh, they become very difficult to use for residences, municipalities, marinas and other shoreline businesses. So what is the solution? The solution really, the only solution that we are aware of is to move to uh, floating docks uh, with ramps and flexible shoreline connections as needed before the next extreme water level event occurs. So again, to David's point, some forward planning and preparation and to provide a long-term solution. Next slide, David. Uh, shoreline and low elevation structures are clearly going to be top of mind for people as well, uh, because we do live at that kind of interface of water and land. And so the high water challenges are, you know, floodwaters that are coming from increasing rainfall, also from these increasing water levels or decreasing water levels. Um, and the wave action on a high water level will just take that run up further up the shore and into the property. But every property is unique, and therefore every property has distinct challenges that individuals are going to have to seek out resources and solutions for. And hopefully you'll find the webinars and the supporting materials that are going to be provided useful in those thought processes. Uh, we will be continuing this, as Cheryl mentioned, Rupert and I both see this as the beginning of the conversation. And we will continue to try to seek out the best information and make it available to our community uh, on what the future forecasts are and so on. But we do see some major investments are going to be needed by municipalities, marinas, and other shoreline businesses. And that's why this action plan 2030 is so critically important. And we do need to get government uh, working towards that and supporting it fully. Um, you may have to consider raising or relocating, retreating, or adapting to these uh, water level changes in order to prevent flooding and flood damage. And also just to ensure the continued access. It's no fun if your cottage gets flooded out and you use the use of it for the entire year, where if you can anticipate these kinds of changes, you'll maintain access. Again, the message forward planning preparation and long-term solution thinking is important. Next slide. So we heard earlier about septic systems in detail um, and um, Neil described how there are limited solutions if uh, high water floods the leaching bed. Um, Relocating to high ground is very expensive and may not even be possible because there may not be any sufficiently higher ground on some locations. Um, and it, or it may be insufficient as a long term solution with ever escalating uh, water levels in the future. Um, I think I noted earlier that municipalities will allow storage tanks as an alternative 
um, if no other option works. They can override the um, Ontario regulations in that respect, um, but it may not be that easy to get them to uh, agree to do that. Uh, you'd have to uh, talk to them, uh, talk to the planning department and get that sorted out if that is what you want to do. Um, there are other options, of course, switching to alternative technologies such as a composting toilet. There are numerous options there. The, uh, the range of options for composting toilets is significantly greater than it used to be. Um, there, there's some very high tech ones out there uh, and, and that all you need with that is a grey water pit, which uh, involves far less hazards. Um, however, there are a very limited number of technologies that are permitted under the Ontario Building Code, and this is something that GBA and GBF will be working together, uh, probably with Georgia Bay Biosphere as well, um, and the Township of the Archipelago, to try and see if we can get the Ontario government to uh, open its books and or its uh, allowable technologies um, to, to provide better solutions going forward on the uh, Precambrian Shield. Again, this is all to do with forward planning and preparation and finding a long-term solution. So now I think we're going to open it up to questions um, for Cheryl and, uh, and David and I. Um, and we have, uh, let's see, we have one question here. Where is it? Um, that came in. Um, given that the middle eight, Great Lake and Georgian Bay have the greatest swing in level of water levels. Uh, have you considered promoting not only LIDAR mapping, but also bathymetric LIDAR mapping? Um, the answer, one answer to that is that's not the case. Um, uh, Lake Michigan Huron has a lower variability in water levels historically than either Erie or Ontario. However, maybe David, you could answer the second part of that question. Certainly, uh, there is some LIDAR data that does penetrate the water and look at uh, the near shore. It has been collected uh, 2018 and 2019 and is currently being processed uh, in Environment and Climate Change Canada. And as Nicola mentioned, there's also, you know, uh, a push to get all of the shoreline of the Great Lakes on the Canadian side mapped out. Much of that work has already been done on the US side and it will allow us to simulate in a community uh, what the floodplain map is going to look like and also how water levels at different heights will impact that community. So a lot of that work is underway. And in some cases, the data has already been connected for wide swaths. Um, there's a general question here. Again, David, maybe you could answer this one about um, how can municipalities like Wasaga Beach mitigate the problem of uh, high water levels? I think this is more of a beach question. Um, and there's, an, uh, there's a similar one about focusing on the southeastern part of Georgian Bay and Seven Sound. Could yeah, you... good question. Uh, you know, a lot of the coastal processes have become kind of uh, foreign to the people living on the coastline. And I think it's important to, re to realize coastal processes are a natural part of the lake, right? And if uh, one property is hardened, it can actually reflect the wave energy onto adjacent properties and cause even more damage. So looking at these, as Cheryl mentioned, from a kind of collective way, uh, you know, broadly as a community uh, to address may mean reestablishing coastal dunes that were natural before, uh, planting those dunes, respecting them so people aren't just camped out on top of them, and looking at not only the recreational space for humans, but also looking at that space as a protective barrier for the properties and coastal areas that are available there. And then again, I think Nicola both uh, and Cheryl mentioned, there is this whole idea of some properties are in those coastal process zones, and we've actually encroached our building historically into those spaces that may well be lost. And we really do need to, to take a look at that and figure out how to you know, justly uh, readjust where we're interfacing with the coastline. There may be places where it's just not possible to protect. So I'm afraid that's all we have time for questions. And uh, we should hand over now to Asia to uh, provide a little wrap up for us. Great, thanks Rupert. Um, these were all great talks today and this whole series has been an excellent uh, opportunity. So for SSEA, we see this as uh, an important opportunity for us to collaborate um, with TBA and GBF that share similar interests uh, to what we're working on in, in Southern Sound and across Georgian Bay. Uh, for the public, this, this series has really increased the awareness 
being done uh, by other agencies across uh, the country and also south of the borders um, from some of the previous webinars. Um, it's been an opportunity to share the current state of knowledge on both the impacts of climate change and water fluctuations from various angles on both the natural environment on and on the built environment, along with some adaptation strategies, um, which folks will be able to use and implement. SSA was pleased to be able to partner on this series and um, to see that it was really driving home the message that resilience is critical. So we're happy to be able to, to keep partnering um, to deliver services to our municipal uh, members that will help increase that resilience. The current situation in BC has really shown us that we can't control natural processes and we can't engineer our way out of everything. Mother Nature will always win, especially when it comes to water. And each of us really has that responsibility uh, to mitigate impacts and build resiliency around our properties. So I thank uh, GBA and GBF again for this great opportunity um, and pass it back to uh, David or Rupert. Hi, thank you, Asia. That's great. Um, so the bottom line in, in terms of what uh, we've learned in this uh, webinar series is that things are changing. In, in, in many respects, they've already changed. Uh, we need to exercise careful thought and planning to protect our properties and uh, ourselves. And we need to consider all the issues. And the, really the purpose of this webinar series was to try and surface all those issues and give you that information. So next slide for David. Yeah, and there will be lots of materials available following the, uh, the webinars. We will be providing people with uh, synopsis and reports and access to the resources that you've seen uh, uh, talked about. But basically the high level takeaways that we've seen through the first and second webinar are that we need to get these updated future water level models out. And we are expecting that in the spring of 2022 from Environment and Climate Change Canada, because it is showing kind of in a, in a modeled way, these increases beyond the historic range, that six and a half foot range uh, historically that we've seen. Uh, we're now expecting possibility of much higher highs and much lower lows. And that's really important for people to understand in their risk management or risk mitigation. Uh, Action Plan 2030 is really important, we think, because it does bring that focus of the governments to kind of align the way that they're all acting and also provide some funding for our coastal municipalities in order to uh, provide that increased resilience. There are climate drivers at play here, including the increasing temperature, both in the air and the water, uh, Peak wind speeds are increasing, even if the averages are kind of declining. And we're operating, all of these things operate at different scales. Some of them are basin wide and some of them operate at very local scales. And future projections basically are for warmer, wetter, wilder conditions. And we need to get ready for that. And that will include impacts on the decreasing ice cover that we're seeing, increases in algae growth, both the blue-green algae and also other nuisance algae because blue-green algae blooms like it hot. And so the, the hotter the water is, we're gonna see these increases uh, continue. Next slide. Uh, additionally, we are seeing lake impacts uh, in wetlands, flora and fauna. Our wetlands are used to these long fluctuations, uh, uh, time periods. And now we're seeing those fluctuations happen in much more compressed time frames. And really we, are doing, we need to do a lot of research to figure out how the wetlands are gonna to respond to that decreasing time between high levels and low levels, um, because they're gonna be important, especially in the near term, filtering out the uh, increasing sewage discharges that we're seeing as a result of these big rainstorms that are overwhelming our, our uh, sewage and stormwater systems. And we are aware from, of a number of reports, uh, including Ontario government reports talking about the fact is that plant species and animal species, in some cases may just be unable to adapt to these changes that are coming. And that will also shift the food web and the ecosystem. And so we need to be able to protect the most vulnerable of those species that we feel we can protect. And that means uh, increasing this living ribbon, as Nicola mentioned, this coastal, uh, naturalization that we need to really protect. So all of these are important learnings that we've seen and, and, and we are really experiencing these in the recent bird deaths that we saw down in uh, uh, the Wasaga Beach, Collingwood and Port Severn area. Uh, you know, these are results of changes that are going on beneath the surface of the water. 
resulting in part from invasive species and exacerbated by climate change. Next slide, over to you, Rupert. Oh, I think this is you as well, actually. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay. So waves are typically, uh, we learned, originating from wind or disturbances such as boat wakes. And they're a result of, uh, you know, the fetch, the exposure to the wind and so on, how long the wind gets to act on the water. Um, but if we can provide naturalized shorelines, these naturalized shorelines have the ability to dissipate that energy very effectively and absorb it instead of just a hard surface which would reflect that energy and just put it into another location, possibly causing more erosion in the lake bed and things like that. Living shorelines absorb that energy and are really important. And you've seen all of the speakers today speak about this uh, and the importance of those buffers. Next slide. Yeah, so one thing we learned is that the high level water marks from our coastal municipalities are lower than they were in 2019 20. And we will continue to discuss with the municipalities the, the uh, suggestion to raise these uh, high water level marks in the future. Water level changes affect many businesses that are part of our coastal infrastructure, including by increasing their capital and operating costs. This is a major issue for marinas, for instance. And we learned about that. Um, so you need planning permission for installing new or replacement docks and for relocating shoreline structures. The information was provided on the ins and outs of that. Um, but the key message was that if you're going to relocate a shoreline structure, consider moving it back above the minimum setback from the high water mark required by the municipality so that you're well prepared for higher water levels. Next slide. And the, the other thing that we learned, a very interesting uh, earlier presentation on approaching natural assets collectively, and that they are often overused and under-recognized, uh, but they do, um, that they provide benefits through the cost effective delivery of core services. So with that, I think we will move on to, uh, um, uh, uh, Marilyn, if you could uh, lead us uh, in prayer for closing off the um, webinar series. And thank you so much again, Marilyn, for being part of this. Such a great part of it. Oh, gee, Miigwech, Rupert. Miigwech, Bonda, Shabonadu. I give thanks to the Creator for making such a beautiful place that we are still discussing as family, sisters and brothers, new colleagues, new friends. I acknowledged the knowledge keepers of Waboos and Wagosh, rabbit and fox that came to give us their knowledge, what to share, how to listen. The rabbit carries those big ears and it was to listen today. And Wagash, very close to the earth as well. And one that knows so much about winter water, the ice. As we were speaking, talking about difficult things, Wagash came to walk through his natural trail in our backyard here. And he turned and he looked and he sat and he listened just for a moment and kept on going. So from that family, Wagosh family, Bodem, his spirit of his responsibility is one that needs to be thought about as we part we see the close of the preparation of the change of the moon, the transition in the rabbit. And we celebrate Earth's natural process. It would be nice to sit in a winter camp sometime after the big spirit moon, the first moon of the turtles coat and if we can't get to do that 
keeps it very tight to your own camp and the spirit of its fire, the center of the circle. And once again, I thank the men for allowing us in visiting through your space and watching over us with such kindness. And I thank Nokomasak, the grandmothers, the knowledge keepers of earth, new life, the old stories and listening like well boost to the new stories. And somehow we have knowledge of how to proceed, how to go forward. And then so I talked last time about the, the weeds that are under the ice today and they're waving in a natural process. And in that sacred word of never saying goodbye to each other, but just simply So until the next time, keep those campfires burning. Now, miigwech. Marilyn, thank you so much. That was truly lovely. And many thanks to all our presenters today for fantastic um, presentations and really informative uh, stuff for our for our uh, participants and thank you for the to the participants for uh, bearing with us i'm sorry we ended a few minutes over time and for all your great questions goodbye everyone and this concludes the 2021 webinar series from gbf and gba goodbye <laughs>